Thank you. It is a thrill and it's an honor to stand before you. Why don't we just put it off on the right over there, right? Thank you. Um, I am a futurist, and that means I spend a lot of time thinking about, writing about, and speaking about the future. And when I speak about the future, I speak all around the world. And I'm so enthusiastic about it that I tend to speak for an hour and a half to three hours. So this is a real disciplined effort for me. So let me get right to it. Uh, a lot of humans have a very odd reaction to change. Most humans I meet are kind of resistant or unsettled by it. A lot of other humans want to embrace it, but don't know what they're embracing. They don't know the uncertainty that they're un embracing. So what I want to do here is to give you the high-level flows that are, will, and for the next 20 years, shape and form all the change that humanity is going to experience. Trends are kind of sub-outcroppings of these flows. So whenever you see a trend, you might be able to relate it up to these flows I'm going to share with you. Now, it is a wonderful, transformative time to be alive. We obviously live in an inflection point in history. We're in a new century. We're in a new age, the shift age, a name I've coined and I'll describe to you briefly in a few minutes. And we're in a new decade, the transformation decade. Again definition forthcoming. But we are also a little more than 1% into this new millennium. Now, the last time that sentence could be said was the year 1011, depth of the dark ages in Europe. Vikings rule the seas. If you will accept an easy premise to accept right now that the speed of change right here, right now, today is 10 times faster than 1011, then all the change that humanity has experienced in the last millennium will be the amount of change we experience in the next 100 years. If you accept from this futurist the probable argument that the speed of change is 100 times faster today than it was in 1011, in the depth of the Dark Ages in Europe, then all the change of the last thousand years that we, humanity, have experienced will be the amount of change we will experience in the next 10 years. Now, that may come up against some of the laws of physics that people who follow me on the stage might refute with me, but somewhere between 10 and 100 times speed of change. So all of the change of the last thousand years we are going to experience between the next 10 and 100 years. So, what is the shift age? And what are the three fundamental forces that have, are, and will for, I'd say, the next 15 years reorganize and reshape humanity? The first is this flow to global. We're obviously getting organized around all of us, the global economy, the macro macro. There's no larger economic unit than all of us. But it's beyond that. We are in the global stage of human evolution. We've gone from family to tribe to village to city to city state to nation state. Our only remaining boundaries for now are planetary. So we are in the global stage of human evolution. And that means that the word globalization is no longer just an economic term. It is the term describing what will course through all aspects of human society for the next 15 years. So we're getting organized around this flow to the global. At the same time, we're getting organized around this flow to the individual. Now, one of the reasons this has happened is over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been this explosion of choice we have more choice in every aspect of our life than we did 30 or 40 years ago. And when that happens, something very significant occurs. The power moves from the producer to the consumer, from the institution to the individual. So we as individuals have more power than individuals have ever had in human history. If you grew up 20, 30, 40 years ago in a city that, say, had two newspapers, and three television stations, that was your choice for information. Now, if you're connected to the internet, it's unlimited choice. So unlimited choice brings all the power to the individual. 
So we're getting organized around the macro macro and the micro micro. There is no smaller economic unit than the individual. And both of these forces are amplified but what I will submit to you is the single most powerful flow and force on the planet today, which is the accelerated electronic connectedness of humanity. It is so powerful. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, when, I was, when I was researching this book I was writing in 2007, I was fascinated by the trajectory of connectivity of the internet of cell phones. And the greatest minds in telephony in 2007, when asked the question, when will we humanity reach 3 billion cell phone subscribers? They all said 2010. Why did they say that? Because it took 20 years to go from the first cell phone subscriber to the billionth. Then it took four years to go from one to two billion. Wow. 500% increase in the rapid rate of growth. That is just so fast, we'll project that linearly into the future. So 2006, oh, 2010. I bought into that. I'll never buy into that again. And nobody in this room should ever buy into the mistake of taking the overwhelming rapid rate of change that is occurring right now and project it linearly into the future. Because here's what happened. We crossed 3 billion cell phone subscribers by the end of the first quarter of 2008. We, there were 700,000 cell phone subscribers on the planet in 1985. So every single day from the latter part of 2006, all 2007, 2008, there was 1.5 million new cell phone subscribers coming online a day. Then we crossed 4 billion cell phone subscribers in April 2009, and today we are at 5.25 billion cell phone subscribers. Now, we've all read the news recently. All of us together represent 7 billion of our species. So what does that mean? Out of that 5 and a quarter billion people who have one of these, they aren't all like this, but they have a cell phone. For 3.5 billion of them, it's the first phone they've ever had. Imagine going from no phone to cell phone. Most everybody here went through the landline. There was a whole leap with cellular. For three billion of them, it's only wealth transference device they have. They have no bank accounts, they have no credit cards. This has brought economic leverage to the third world for the first time. Because it gives everybody a chance to connect. If you lived in a sub-Saharan village uh, up until recently, you would take your goods, your craft goods, your agricultural goods to the next biggest town and go, what do you pay me? That guy would lowball you because he was the only option. Now you have a cell phone that you can call around, economic leverage. But what this really means is if I was calling Bob here, who's 10 feet away from me, if I had Bob's cell phone number, and I think I do, if I was to call it, right, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, five seconds, Bob's phone would ring. If I were to call China, 12, 14,000 miles away, because of the relay of the satellite, maybe an additional two seconds. So what five and a quarter billion cell phone subscribers means is the difference between 10 feet and 12,000 miles is two seconds. So for the first time in human history, it can be said there is no time or distance limiting human communication. Worth repeating, there is no time or distance limiting human communication. That didn't exist when my parents were growing up. Now, quick question to the room. If you're on your cell phone and you're calling somebody else on the cell phone, after, hey, how you doing, and can you hear me okay? What's one of the questions you might ask? Anybody? Where are you? Exactly right. So there's no time, distance, or place any longer limiting human communication. So place has been eliminated from communication. It doesn't matter where you are. That is so powerful. So what are the dynamic flows that flow from that? The first is power to the people. Now, I'm from the 60s, but that's not what I mean, right? <laughs> in 06, 07, 08, when I started talking actively about the future around the world, I'm very optimistic about it. And people would say to me, for example, but what about dictatorships? What about radical Islam? Isn't that going to put a damper on everything? And I said, and I promise you I said this, 06, 07, 08, there will be upheaval in dictatorships and Islamic states in the next three to five years that will be unimaginable. 
I didn't know to call it Arab Spring. I didn't know what was going to happen in the spring. I knew it was going to happen. Why? Because of the accelerated connectedness of the planet. Every single country in the Arab Spring has two common denominators. One, accelerated electronic connectedness, social media, and two, 45 to 55 percent of the population's age is under 25 in every one of those countries. Now, I talk about millennials and digital natives a lot, and I won't this morning, but you take the youth and the accelerated connectedness, and there you have it. So, whenever you see a new technology, oh, the new iPhone, or the new this, or the new that, oh, how many gigahertz, is it 3G, is it 4G? Look past that to think about what is the power this technology gives us. That's what the story is. I travel all the world talking to CEOs and to corporations, and I say, if you had one, maybe two app phones, and you were running a global company, and you had the right connectivity, you could run your global company from a park bench for a day. That's what this is. This is power to the people, right? We're moving from structures to nets. Obviously, when the industrial age occurred, management said, gee, how do we run this? Oh, we'll model the military. Hierarchical, got it, okay. So that's what the industrial age was. Centralized, hierarchical. 20th century, silos, high-rises, skyscrapers. 21st century, nets, right? That's the metaphor for the 21st century. I say to corporations all the time, stop thinking about management structures and think about nodes of a net. Finance node, IP node, sales node. So we're moving to nets from structures. That's a very significant flow of power, again, to the individual, because we can synaptically connect around the world with no time or distance or place limiting us. We live in a broadband world, right? At least everybody here probably has high-speed internet connectivity. So we live in a broadband world. And what that means is that we have two realities today. We have the physical reality we grew up in and where our parents spent most of their lives, and we have the screen reality. And depending on who you are, how old you are, and what you do, that screen reality is every bit as compelling as the physical reality. How a teenager shows up on Facebook this weekend is every bit as important as how she shows up in high school Monday morning. So you have two realities to manage, the physical reality and the screen reality. Again, I talk and advise companies all the time, always asking me these questions about social media and all that, and I kind of go, have you ever got business from word of mouth and the physical reality? All social media is, is word of mouth in the screen reality. Because again, authority has gone from institutional to personal. Why did I brush my teeth with Crest? Because the American Dental Association said so. Some of you may remember, why did my mother buy stuff with the good housekeeping seal of approval? Because it was institutional. Now it's what my friends tell me, right? So that's the power on the screen. High concept, we're moving from physical to non-physical from the mid-70s to the mid-20s, from 1975 to 2025. The information age, that was when physicality got removed from product, right? Money, late 70s, electronic fund transfer. Now money moves around the world at the speed of light through fiber optics. So think of all those companies that are in ascendancy and they're in non-physical reality. We all do something every day that's an activity, call it a product, call it search. Where does that happen? In non-physical reality. So there's this arc, and again, I said I define what the transformation decade is. So, you know, we're real odometer-oriented, humanities and particularly Americans. Remember 1999? What are you going to do New Year's Eve, right? Because four digits were going to roll over to 2000. Actually, the new millennium was 2000, 2001, right? But because four digits were going to roll over, we were obsessed with that. Same thing happened at the end of 09. What's this new decade going to be? So I threw in the towel as a futurist, and I said, OK, I'm going to call it this. So on 01, 01, 10, interesting digital date to begin the new uh, decade, I called it the transformation decade. And it blew up on Twitter, it blew up in the blogosphere. Here's the definition. It's a simple definition, a change in form, appearance, nature, or character. So what that means is that this decade that we are now in, 
all of humanity and most of its institutions are going to change their form, appearance, nature, and character. So I say to companies, you know, who are following some kind of management theory that we all might come to mind here based on 20th century businesses, is if you want to stay current in this next 10 years, you have to change your form, appearance, and nature, or character of company, institution, university. Higher ed is about ready to go through major transformation between now and 2020. There's no question about it. You know what else this decade is? It's the first decade of 21st century thought. Why? Because we have all kind of barreled into this 21st century with legacy thinking of the 20th. You see it in Washington. That's why it's not working. It's not that stuff might be too big to fail. It might just be legacy structures of the 20th century or, be, or earlier. So we've kind of barreled into this. Marshall McLuhan famously said, most of the people drive down the freeway of life looking in the rearview mirror. Everybody's got their story. Where are you going? So, so now, if you think about, if I say 20th century to you, what comes to mind? American century, century of science, century of world war. It really began with World War I, 1914 to 1918, Russian Revolution, right? The map of Europe largely formed them. The map of the Middle East largely formed them. Biplanes going in, mono wings coming out. So as we look back, the trajectory of the last century was formed then. Future historians are going to go, this is the decade where they realize it was a new century, it was the global stage of human evolution, and it was time to face the problems that we have to face today, not using the legacy thinking of the past. So basically, we live in a wonderful time a time of transformation, a time of shift, where everything in your life is in some rate of relative shift. Noticeable, imperceptible, from moment to moment, but over a period of time, you will see everything has shifted. So let me leave you with this quote, which is the greatest quote about the future I have ever seen. We should try to be the parents of our future rather than the offspring of our past. When you, if you're running some kind of institution and you get to January 2012, Please don't compare it to January 2011. Use it as a stepping stone for what you want January 2013 to be. So we should all try to be the parents of our future rather than the offspring of our past. Thank you. Thank you.